When a person disappears, investigators are trapped in a race against time to gather evidence and find the missing person. CCTV is one of the most powerful tools investigators have at their fingertips, as it provides them with an accurate look at the victim's last movements. Number 5 48-year-old Hattie Gertrude Brown was described by her family as a kind and loving woman. Despite her busy schedule, Hattie always made time for her family and was always there to help them when they needed a hand. Hattie's kindness extended beyond her family, and those around her knew that they could depend on her. Hattie also had a tough side, one that had served in the U.S. military and knew how to take care of herself. Hattie's extensive military experience made her disappearance all the more bizarre in early 2009. Hattie Brown was born September 21, 1960. She'd been a lifelong resident of Halifax County, Virginia. Hattie and her siblings spent their childhoods wandering the woods and roads of Halifax County, giving them a special closeness. In 1978, Hattie walked across the stage and graduated from Halifax County High School. By the late 80s, she'd enlisted as a member of the U.S. Army, and after passing basic training, she was stationed across the U.S. before being posted abroad. In 1991, Hattie and her battalion were sent to Kuwait and Iraq in what the U.S. government dubbed Desert Storm, now called the Gulf War. U.S. troops were responding to the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, which would trigger decades' worth of conflict in the Middle East. Hattie's bravery knew no end, and according to reports, she was the first woman in her unit to obtain her air assault badge. Her natural skill and talent saw her sent to airborne school in North Carolina after she toured Iraq. In 1998, Sergeant Hattie Brown retired from the U.S. Army after a long and decorated career. She would have likely remained in the Army had it not been for her ailing mother, who required round-the-clock care. After retirement, Hattie found a civilian job and took on the role of caregiver alongside her siblings. For many years, life for the Browns went on as usual. That was until 2009. May 16th of 2009 was set to be as unremarkable as the last for Hattie. But that was until she received an early morning call from her nephew, Derek Edward Brown. It was around 2 a.m. when Hattie's phone rang and on the line was Derek. Not wanting to leave a family member stranded, Hattie agreed to pick Derek up at the Sheets gas station at the intersection of Route 501 and Route 58 at 107 Philpot Road, South Boston, Virginia. At around 2.30 a.m., Hattie arrived at the gas station. CCTV footage shows Hattie and her nephew, Derek, in her brown silver 2003 Volkswagen Jetta, making their way out of the gas station at 2.33 a.m. According to Derek, he then asked Hattie to drive him to a party in Halifax County, to which she agreed. Sometime after leaving the gas station, the two arrived, and Derek said goodbye to his aunt. He later told investigators that this was the last time he saw Hattie and she was in her idling car outside the party. Later that morning, Derek called his aunt to thank her, but he received no answer. After calling around the family, they realized Hattie was missing. Derek had made it home safely, so why hadn't Hattie? The family began their search of the party but found no sign of Hattie or her car. When they failed to turn up any evidence, they reported her missing to the Halifax County Sheriff's Office. Hours after Hattie was last seen, an investigation was opened, and the family would be shocked at what the police discovered. A search of Hattie's Halifax County home only added to her family's worries. She had left behind her purse, wallet, medication, and her beloved chihuahua. She would have taken these things should she have left of her own accord. Hattie's family assured the police she had no reason to leave and showed no bizarre or concerning behavior in the days before her disappearance. According to reports, Derek Brown, Hattie's nephew, has a prior criminal record with offenses of breaking and entering, destruction of property, and possession of burglary tools. Derek kept to his version of events, telling investigators Hattie picked him up at the Sheets gas station at 2.30 a.m. that morning and dropped him off at a party. Other partygoers also claimed to have seen Hattie sitting in her car outside the party, but nobody saw her leaving. Despite numerous potential witnesses, Hattie's case quickly went cold. Nobody came forward with information, and her family fought to keep her name in the media. 
Then, two months later, in July of 2009, Hattie's case would take yet another bizarre turn. In July of that year, Hattie's brown and silver Jetta was found on a farm in southeastern Halifax County, 15 miles from the Sheets gas station. The car had been burned and destroyed and left at the farm. According to officials, the farmland was rural and only a spot a local would have known about. It was secluded and whoever disposed of Hattie's car knew it would take a long time to be discovered. Upon discovering Hattie's car, the Halifax County Sheriff's Office listed Derek Brown, Hattie's nephew, as their prime suspect. Derek has continued to maintain his innocence and has never formally been charged with Hattie's disappearance. In the wake of her disappearance, Hattie's family never stopped looking for her. She's the youngest of 12 siblings, five of whom are still living. The Brown family has been faced with tremendous tragedy, and in 2013, they were struck again. On November 28, 2013, Hattie's older brother, 61-year-old James Brown Jr., disappeared from Neal's Corner Road in Clover, Virginia. Investigators do not believe the disappearances are connected, just a terrible coincidence for one family. In 2016, Hattie was legally declared deceased in absence, without the presence of remains. In the 14 years since Hattie's disappearance, her family have upped their reward from $2,500 to $10,000, hoping this will entice someone to come forward with information. Each year on May 16th, her family gathers to remember her and pray that they will finally have answers and justice one day. Anyone with information is asked to contact Senior Special Agent Kevin George of the Virginia State Police at 434-414-4450, quoting case number 0983025007. Number 4 25-year-old Shelton Sanders had big dreams and an even bigger heart. Born and raised in Rembert, South Carolina, Shelton had dreams of owning his own business and rearing cattle. As the oldest of four children, Shelton was a shining example to his younger siblings, who often looked to him for guidance and support. Shelton took his big brotherly role very seriously and was a fierce protector of his siblings. In 2001, Shelton celebrated his 25th anniversary and looked forward to what the future held. Just weeks before school was out, Shelton would disappear. Shelton's parents, William and Peggy, took great pride in their son's achievements. In 1994, Shelton graduated from Hillcrest High School in Simpsonville, South Carolina, and took a few years to decide what he wanted to do. Eventually, Shelton enrolled at the University of South Carolina in Columbia, 42 miles from his home in Rembert. He majored in administrative information management with the view of operating his own business one day. Alongside his strenuous studies, Shelton also worked part-time as a programmer at the University of South Carolina Medical School's Neuropsychiatry Department. From an early age, Shelton had shown inklings of being a computer wiz, and as technology progressed, so did his knowledge. Whenever a family member had a computer issue, they went straight to Shelton, who immediately knew the answer. Every day, Shelton made the 42-mile drive to the University of South Carolina. Many students lived on campus, but Shelton wanted to remain close to his family. Shelton's professors would describe him as an intelligent and capable young man. With a GPA of 3.5, graduation seemed likely. But unfortunately, before Shelton could get his degree and prosper his own business, he would disappear. June 19, 2001 started like any other day for Shelton. He woke up early, gathered his textbooks, and made the 42-mile drive from Rembert to Columbia. The university later confirmed Shelton had attended all of his classes and was seen around campus. He also turned up for his appointed shift, leaving some time in the evening. At around 8.30 p.m., Shelton's mother, Peggy, received a call from her son, letting her know he would be home late. Shelton explained that he and Mark Richardson, a former college roommate, were planning a bachelor party and wanted to head into the city to book a venue. Usually, he'd be home around 9, but June 19th would be different. Peggy and Shelton said their goodbyes, not knowing it would be the last time they would ever speak. At around 9.30 p.m., Shelton and Mark were seen at the Wellesley Inn and Suites Hotel, inquiring about the prices to rent a room. At 9.51 p.m., the two entered the Embassy Suites Hotel before last appearing at the Residence Inn at around 10 p.m. After much deliberation, 
Mark decided to reserve a suite at the Residence Inn. The two left some time later, having left a deposit and contact details. According to Mark, the two returned to his apartment after leaving the Residence Inn. Sometime between 11 p.m. and 11.30 p.m., Mark alleges Shelton left his apartment to make the 42-mile drive home to Rembert. On June 20th, 2001, Peggy was awoken early by the house phone ringing off the hook. Shelton had failed to show up for his shift at the USC Medical School that morning. Shelton had never missed a shift before, and his behavior was extremely out of character. Peggy and her husband, William, began calling Shelton, but they received no answer. Friends and family similarly tried to call Shelton, but each time it went straight to voicemail. Hours after receiving the call that changed her life, Peggy Sanders contacted the Sumter County Sheriff's Office and reported her son missing. The search for Shelton was immediately on, with investigators taking to the streets where he was last seen. The Sumter County Sheriff's Office also looked at his phone and bank accounts to see if there had been any suspicious behavior. Shelton's last confirmed call was made at 9.07 p.m. to Mark Richardson, who said he lost his phone and had asked Shelton to call it. After this, Shelton goes dark. Since his 2001 disappearance, there's been no activity on his phone or bank accounts. Days after Shelton's disappearance, a neighbor of Mark Richardson's came forward with a very troubling account. From 11 to 11.30 p.m. on June 19, 2001, the neighbor recalled hearing three loud shots from the direction of Mark's apartment. Minutes later, Mark emerged, letting the neighbors know that everything was okay, and the noise had come from his car, which backfired. Shortly after this witness sighting, the Sumter County Sheriff's Office received a tip that Shelton's body had been dumped in the waters of the Watery and Congaree Rivers, but this tip amounted to nothing. Each tip the Sumter County Sheriff's Office received was followed to its end, and there was no shortage of leads. There was one piece of the puzzle that was missing, though. The white 1998 Oldsmobile Regency that Shelton had borrowed from his brother. If Shelton had made the drive home, where was the car? It would take two whole years for this question to be answered. On April 26, 2003, officers with the Richland County Sheriff's Office made a shocking discovery. Parked in the Greenbrier apartment complex in Columbia, South Carolina, was the white 1998 Oldsmobile Regency that belonged to Shelton Sanders. A physical inspection of the car proved it had been there for months, if not years. The tires were flat, it was out of gas, and brake fluid had leaked onto the ground. This discovery prompted the Sumter County Sheriff's Office to dig deeper into Mark Richardson, the last person with Shelton. Sergeant McDaniels of the Richland County Sheriff's Office told Dateline, quote, we triangulated his cell phone records and were able to, on the night that Shelton Sanders was last seen and heard from, we were able to put Mark Richardson's cell phone records right where the car was found. During questioning, Mark acted bizarrely and gave elusive answers. Two years later, the Sumter County Sheriff's Office made a shocking arrest in Shelton's case. When they arrested Mark, unfortunately, no physical evidence was lifted from the car and the only pieces of evidence to connect Mark to Shelton's disappearance were the witness reports and cell phone data. It took three years for Mark's counsel to be ready for trial, and in early 2008, Mark Richardson took the stand. Mark's defense rested on the fact that the evidence was circumstantial. His defense team argued that without Shelton's body, there was no evidence to suggest any crime had been committed. Shelton's family were disappointed and heartbroken at the trial as his final moments were recounted once more. After weeks of deliberation, the jury had reached a verdict. Seven people voted guilty, and five voted not guilty or undecided, leading to the proceedings ending in a mistrial. Mark Richardson was released from custody, and Shelton's family were forced to confront the idea that they may never see true justice for him. Since the 2008 trial, few details have been released, and the DA's office has not announced whether Mark Richardson will be retried at any point. Shelton's family continues to fight to keep his name in the media and believes that someone out there knows something. Anyone with information is asked to contact Dottie Croncy of the Richland County Sheriff's Department at 803-576-3000. Number 3. Twenty-three-year-old Jasmine Robinson was focused on her future and that of her unborn child. In 2018, Jasmine discovered she was pregnant and was elated at the prospect of becoming a mother. 
While Jasmine tried to carve a stable future for her child, things didn't always go that way. And just months before she was due to give birth, she found herself in court. Despite the legal battles and battles with the baby's father, Jasmine was determined to put things right, and then out of thin air, she disappeared. Jasmine Beasy Robinson was born in Archer, Florida on February 6, 1996. Jasmine and her family maintained a close bond and she was incredibly close to her younger sister, Shantavia, and her aunts. From an early age, Jasmine showed a keen interest in sports, with her sport of choice being basketball. Jasmine joined her school's basketball teams and adopted the nickname Beasy, and this high school nickname followed her into adulthood. Outside of sports, Jasmine was also devoted to her faith and sang in the St. Joseph Baptist Church Choir. In 2018, Jasmine discovered she was pregnant, and she excitedly shared the news with her sister, Shantavia, and her grandmother, whom she was living with. Jasmine knew she had to get things together in anticipation of the baby that she wanted to call either Jamila or Jamila. As the months passed, Jasmine attended her prenatal appointments and received ultrasound scans of her baby. She was due to give birth on May 10th, 2018. After discovering she was pregnant, Jasmine was unable to play basketball but continued watching the sport. On September 13th, 2018, Jasmine attended a game at the University of Florida when something inside of her changed. She did something she'd never done before. While the game was in play, Jasmine stole a phone and tried to transfer herself a total sum of $1,600. Sources can't agree on whether the money was transferred via Cash App, Venmo, or other means such as PayPal. Eventually, the victim noticed her phone was missing and reported the incident to the campus security. The situation soon escalated when the Archer police became involved and began investigating. Jasmine had made it to her grandmother's home with the phone, but the police were not far behind, all thanks to the Find My iPhone feature. The tracking feature led the police right to Jasmine's door, and after pleading ignorance, she turned the phone over and admitted her wrongdoings. At initial proceedings, Jasmine was to be charged with larceny and filed a motion of not guilty. Her family pleaded with her to enter the guilty plea and correct the wrongs. Jasmine's second hearing was due to take place on February 28, 2019 when she would be in her third trimester and heavily pregnant. Her family and legal counsel's pleas worked, and before the hearing was due to take place, Jasmine filed a motion to change her plea. February 18th was like any other day for Jasmine. She got up early, said good morning to Jamila, and went to work at McDonald's. That evening, Jasmine's grandmother drove to her workplace in Archer and picked her up. Her grandmother recalled that evening that something was off with Jasmine. She was irritated and was upset but wouldn't tell her grandmother what was wrong. Her grandmother chalked it up to a stressful work day and the two drove home. Once at home, Jasmine FaceTimed with her sister Shantavia and spoke to her aunt on the phone. At around 8 p.m., Jasmine turned herself into bed as she had a long and busy day coming up. Her sister also echoed her grandmother's sentiments of Jasmine being not all that okay and something was definitely bothering her. The following day, Jasmine's aunt arrived at her home bright and early, but when she knocked on the door, she got no reply. Minutes later, Jasmine's grandmother came to the door confused. The appointment had been scheduled for weeks and she'd not seen Jasmine since the night before. Jasmine had around three months left on her pregnancy, and there was no reason for her to leave. Her family searched high and low for her, but her phone rang out. Hours after Jasmine failed to show up for her doctor's appointment, her sister called the Alachua County Sheriff's Office and reported her missing. Archer, Florida has a population of just over a thousand, and the news of Jasmine's disappearance spread like wildfire. The small town mentality took over and rumors began to run wild. Some speculated Jasmine had run away because of her upcoming court case, while others wondered if the father of her child had anything to do with her disappearance. Regarding her court case, Jasmine filed a motion to change her plea and wanted to pay the victim back all of her money. With a child on the way in under four months, Jasmine wanted to right her wrongs and get her life back on track for the arrival of her daughter. While she was scared about the birth, her family made it known that they would be there for her every step of the way and she'd receive the level of support that she needed. According to Detective Chris Witzel of the Alachua County Sheriff's Office, Jasmine did get into an argument with someone the night she disappeared. When she discovered she was pregnant, she found herself in a difficult situation. The father of the child, who's never been named, although there have been several possible suspects put forward, 
was married and wanted nothing to do with Jasmine. NBC reported that the father of the child had allegedly been harassing Jasmine in the lead up to her disappearance. Some in Archer believed that it was the father of the child with whom Jasmine got into an argument with the night she disappeared. Some have postulated the man's wife found out about Jasmine's pregnancy, causing a fight. Disturbingly, homicide is the leading cause of mortality in pregnant women, and perhaps Jasmine fell victim to the epidemic that's been sweeping the U.S. for many decades. As the years go by, the Alachua County Sheriff's Office received drips of information here and there, but so far, no arrests have been made. We know that Jasmine left her grandmother's home sometime on May 18, 2019. But why and where did she go? She didn't have a car and she was heavily pregnant. Investigators believe she met with foul play, but until evidence surfaces, we may never know what happened to Jasmine. Anyone with information is asked to contact Detective Christopher Witzel of the Alachua County Sheriff's Office at 352-367-4000. Number 2. Brooklyn Farthing of Berea, Kentucky was at a crossroads in her life. The 18-year-old had recently graduated from Madison Southern High School and was deciding where to attend next. Part of her wanted a break from schooling and academia, while another wanted to follow her passion for makeup. This latter passion would have seen Brooklyn enrolled in cosmetology school, an idea she was enthusiastic about. Before Brooklyn could make any life-changing decisions, she disappeared under some of the most bizarre circumstances Kentucky has ever seen. June 21, 2013 was an exciting day for Brooklyn and her sister Paige. The two took their driving tests that morning, and Brooklyn was elated to find out she had passed. Unfortunately, her sister Paige had not, and Brooklyn consoled her sister. The sadness was short-lived and the sisters were back to laughter and smiles by that afternoon. Early that evening, the Farthing family attended a birthday party where the entire family gathered together. After the family party, Brooklyn, Paige, and their cousin drove to another party on Red Lick Road in Berea. Sometime between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m., Paige and her cousin left the party, leaving Brooklyn with her friends. Brooklyn had planned to stay the night at a friend's home and had taken her overnight back. Hours later, when the girls agreed to leave, an argument broke out. The friend with whom Brooklyn was supposed to be staying had changed the plans and now wanted to spend the night at a boy's house. According to partygoers, this made Brooklyn extremely uncomfortable, and the friend left without her, leaving Brooklyn stranded. Minutes later, Brooklyn was seen leaving the party with Josh Hensley and another young man who had not been publicly identified. Sometime after midnight, the trio left the party, and according to Josh, they stopped to look at some horses. After seeing the horses, he drove himself and Brooke back to his home in the 100 block of Dillon Court Road. In June of 2013, the home on Dillon Court Road was under foreclosure, and the home had no water or electricity. Brooklyn became increasingly uncomfortable at Josh's house as the night progressed. At 4 a.m., she called her sister Paige and asked if their cousin could come and get her. Brooklyn was informed her cousin had been drinking, and she continued through her list of contacts, one of which was her ex-boyfriend or ex-fiancé. Unfortunately, he was at work and was not able to get Brooklyn until around 7 a.m. At 5.30 a.m., Brooklyn sent what would be her final message. In her previous messages, she had asked her ex-boyfriend to hurry because she was scared, but all of a sudden, her tone changed. In the final message, Brooklyn said, Never mind, I'm okay. I'm going to a party in Rock Castle County. When her ex-boyfriend asked who she was going with, he received no reply. When Brooklyn failed to return home the following day, her parents and sister became worried. This behavior was out of character for Brooklyn, and it wasn't like her to not answer her phone. After speaking to other partygoers, Paige learned that Brooklyn had gotten a ride with Josh Hensley. When questioned by Brooklyn's family, Josh produced an unbelievable story. Josh claimed to have left his home sometime in the early morning hours, leaving Brooklyn alone. At 7 a.m., he returned to find the couch Brooklyn had been sitting on, on fire. Josh claimed that when he stepped out of the home, Brooklyn had been smoking a cigarette which he believes caused the fire. When her parents learned of this, they reported their daughter missing. Local police were immediately suspicious of Josh Hensley's story and ordered a search of his property. Brooklyn's cowboy boots, purse, and overnight bag were all found at Dillon Court Road, with the only things missing being her phone. 
Since her disappearance, her phone has never been recovered and there's been no activity on her social media accounts. A forensic fire investigation casts shadows of doubt over Josh's story, but without physical evidence, the police were unable to move forward with charges. Partygoers were interviewed at length, but nobody recalled seeing or hearing anything unusual that evening. Searches for Brooklyn continued until July of 2013 when they were called off. Shortly after her disappearance, the Kentucky State Police became involved in Brooklyn's case. Both the Kentucky State Police and Brooklyn's family do not believe her final text message was written by her, and she likely met with foul play. Numerous tips have been called in, but none of them have led to the whereabouts of her remains or an arrest. According to reports, Brooklyn's phone was tracked, and the last ping came from a tower in Blue Lick. Over the last 10 years, Brooklyn's family has worked hard to keep her name in the media, as has the local community. There have been several fundraisers and awareness events in Brooklyn's name, and as of 2023, the reward fund stands at $14,000. Anybody with information is asked to contact Detective Michael Keaton of the Kentucky State Police at 859-623-2404, quoting case number 7130451. Number 1. 31-year-old Melinda McGee was described as an extremely intelligent and determined young woman. By 2003, Melinda had been married to her husband, Troy McGee, for seven years, and the two had given birth to two children. Additionally, a child from a previous relationship lived with the couple, and the five of them settled into a home on Kent Road in Atmore, Alabama. Troy and Melinda were like two passing ships in the night, and their schedules rarely had them at home together. March 24, 2003 was one of those days, but when Troy returned home from work, he sensed something was wrong. Melinda wore many hats and juggled many roles. Aside from being a mother to three children, Melinda also worked 12-hour night shifts as a nurse at the Oakwood Nursing Home. As if this wasn't challenging enough, Melinda also attended university where she was studying to become a nurse. In March of 2003, Melinda was just months away from graduating and receiving her license. On top of these other responsibilities, Melinda also worked as a nurse in the area's prisons. Melinda's hectic shifts and studies saw her out of the house for most of the day. Her husband Troy worked a traditional job where he was home by 4 p.m. every afternoon to care for the children. On March 24, 2003, Melinda powered through her 12-hour night shift, sipping on copious cups of coffee to keep her going. At around 7 a.m., Melinda finished her shift and began the short drive home. Melinda and her husband had a routine, as by the time she arrived home, he was already at work. Melinda would call her husband and her mother to let them know she'd gotten home safely. After that, she headed to bed for some much-needed rest before being due at university or the area's prisons. On the morning of March 24, 2003, Melinda called her mother as usual and the two spoke for a few minutes. After talking to her mother, Melinda called Troy and the two discussed their upcoming plans for the day. According to reports, Melinda's two biological children were with the babysitter and Troy's son from a previous relationship at a dental appointment. Minutes later, Melinda ended the call saying I love you to her husband for one last time. Presumably, Melinda headed to bed to get some much needed rest. At around 4 p.m. that afternoon, Troy returned home with the children to find the home empty. He called out for his wife, but there was no reply. As Troy entered the house, he found the scene of a violent struggle. Red smears covered every surface, and it was clear Melinda had fought her attacker valiantly. Troy gathered the children, placed them outside, and called the Escambia County Sheriff's Office to report the disturbance. Minutes later, the Escambia County Sheriff's Office arrived at the scene and began searching for Melinda. A full sweep of the home was conducted, and the police quickly established that Melinda was not inside. Bizarrely, her car was found outside the home with the keys locked inside. Her purse and phone were found inside the home, and she would not have left without them. Atmore is a rural but somewhat close-knit area, especially Kent Road. Melinda and Troy's home sat at the end of a dirt road with just three other homes around them. None of the McGee's neighbors reported hearing a disturbance the day Melinda disappeared, although given how rural the area is, they may not have heard anything anyway. Searches for Melinda were immediately put together, with teams from other counties coming in to assist. 
news of Melinda's disappearance quickly spread through Atmore, and residents turned out in droves to help find Melinda. She was known in the community as compassionate and kind, and nobody could think of any reason why someone might want to harm her. The Escambia County Sheriff's Office made a stunning link just days into the investigation. At the time, an unknown serial killer had been terrorizing Louisiana's Baton Rouge and Lafayette areas. Atmore, Alabama is 250 miles away, and investigators hypothesized whether the Baton Rouge serial killer was responsible for Melinda's disappearance. In May of 2003, Derek Todd Lee was arrested and charged in the Baton Rouge serial killer case. Lee broke into his victims' homes before attacking and assaulting them. Oftentimes, Lee would remove his victims' bodies from their homes, choosing to dump them dozens of miles away, where it would take a significant amount of time for them to be discovered. DNA conclusively linked Derek Todd Lee to at least seven crimes, and in 2004, he was sentenced to capital punishment. It was only after his arrest that DNA linked Lee to several other crimes, and investigators believe he may be responsible for the disappearances of Randy Mabruer, Mary Fowler, and Glenn Tankersley. Until solid evidence linking Derek Todd Lee to the disappearance of any of these women is found, no further charges will be filed. Searches for Melinda have continued over the years, with investigators focusing their efforts to the Alabama-Florida state lines. In 2010, Melinda McGee was declared deceased in absence, and a cold case investigator was assigned to her case. While Derek Todd Lee is a candidate, many do not believe he's responsible, given the distance between the crimes. Troy McGee, Melinda's husband, was quickly ruled out as a suspect and has continued to fight to keep his wife's case alive. In 2012, the Escambia County Sheriff's Department utilized cadaver dogs in a search of a septic tank on Ewing Farm Road a stone's throw from Melinda's Kent Road home. Unfortunately, this search proved fruitless, and investigators continued to monitor her case. Over the years, sets of skeletal remains have been discovered, which has breathed new life into the case, but each time the family is informed that the remains do not belong to Melinda. Anyone with information is asked to contact Lindsay Miles of the Escambia County Sheriff's Office at 251-867-0304. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.